we now have a good idea behind what's going on with acetylcholine across the body. The next neurotransmitter that I want to cover is one we haven't seen yet, and it is glutamate. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain and the spinal cord. To understand its function, let's consider a synapse with presynaptic glutamate and the respective postsynaptic receptors. Let's first start presynaptically and discuss the life cycle of glutamate from the synthesis to its recycling. Glutamate is directly synthesized at the terminal from glutamine in a straightforward reaction catalyzed by the enzyme glutaminase. To get the transmitter inside the vesicles, the vesicles have a V-class ATPase that pumps protons inside the vesicle and then the proton gradient is used to import the glutamate inside the vesicle. The transporter that mediates this exchange is named the vesicular glutamate transporter. Now that the vesicles are full of glutamate, they can be released in the cleft by the same general principles that we've covered in the vesicle cycle section. The action potential depolarizes the cell, opens voltage-gated calcium channels, which fuses the vesicles and releases glutamate in the cleft. When glutamate is in the cleft, it will be able to bind to its various receptors. But before I move on to the specific receptors of glutamate, I want to first discuss how the signal is terminated because it uses a different mechanism that we haven't seen yet. In our discussion on acetylcholine, remember that the mechanism to terminate the acetylcholine signal is to degrade it through a specific enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, which turns acetylcholine into acetate and choline. This type of mechanism is generally labeled as neurotransmitter degradation. In the case of glutamate, the mechanism that terminates the signal is neurotransmitter reuptake. An integral component of this mechanism is a glial cell named the astrocyte. Astrocytes participate both with the presynaptic and the postsynaptic cell, and for that reason, it is often said that the three structures form a tripartite synapse. Now, when glutamate is in the synaptic cleft, it can enter the astrocyte and the presynaptic cell through a class of transporters called the excitatory amino acid transporters, or simply EAAT. These transporters co-transport glutamate with sodium. The glutamate that is transported into the astrocyte is converted back to glutamine by the enzyme glutamine synthetase. This glutamine is then transported out of the astrocyte by a different transporter named the system N transporter 1 or SN1 which co-transports sodium as well. The glutamine that has been extruded from the astrocyte can then enter the presynaptic terminal through another transporter called the System A transporter, or SAT2, and be reconverted into glutamate by glutaminase. This final step ties in the reuptake process of glutamate. I want to mention as a side note that the glutamate can also be synthesized at the presynaptic terminal from glucose. As glucose gets oxidized in the mitochondria through the citric acid cycle, it eventually forms a compound by the name of alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha-ketoglutarate can get converted into glutamate by an enzyme called glutamate dehydrogenase. Last note, I want to mention that you might find in some literature that the excitatory amino acid transporters, or EAAT, are also named GLAST and GLT, which stand for glutamate aspartate transporter, and glutamate transporter. Back to the synaptic cleft, let's now see what receptors glutamate interacts with. These receptors can either be ionotropic or metabotropic. So let's start with the ionotropic receptors first. There are three major types of ionotropic receptors, NMDA, AMPA, and kinate. Similar to acetylcholine receptors, the nomenclature for these receptors comes from the agonists that open them. These three receptors also have antagonists that block their opening. The drug AP5 blocks the NMDA receptors, and the drug CNQX blocks the AMPA and kinate receptors. These compounds will be important to consider later as they will help us determine some properties of the channels. Alright, now when glutamate does bind and opens each channel, the three mediate an inward current that depolarizes the cell when the membrane potential is negative. The inward current from the three channels is composed out of a potassium and sodium component just like the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. One important detail is that the NMDA receptor, contrarily to the AMPA and the kinase receptor, is highly permeable to calcium, but this is a detail I'll come back to shortly. When we consider the IV curve for these receptors, the reversal potential for each is near zero, 
so about in between the reversal potential of sodium and potassium. If you want to get more information on IV curves and how we can determine which arms go through ligand gated receptors, I suggest you to consider going to the neuromuscular junction video where I thoroughly explain how IV curves can be made for acetylcholine receptors from patch clamp results. Since glutamate receptors, especially AMPA and kinate, behave in the same way as the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the video should be very helpful if needed. Now, in terms of structure, the three receptors have all the common features that we have discussed in previous sections about channels. They have an extracellular ligand binding region and the pore that allows the flow of ions. One thing about the structure of these channels that I want to mention though, is that the specificity to calcium for the NMDA receptor comes from the fact that it has an important asparagine residue in its pore that the other channels don't have. Speaking of the NMDA receptor, I want to analyze it a bit further because it is a rather unique receptor among the ligand-gated channels in its ability to conduct current. For the NMDA receptor to open, it requires two factors. First, the receptor must bind its ligand, which, as we've discussed, is glutamate, but it turns out that to open the NMDA receptor, it also requires the binding of glycine. Glycine is a neurotransmitter that we will cover later that is involved in some inhibitory circuits, but here it acts as a coagonist to the NMDA receptor. Now, to understand the second factor, you must know that at rest, magnesium binds tightly to the NMDA receptor and essentially acts as a plug to the channel. This magnesium interaction blocks any synaptic current from occurring, even if glutamate and glycine are bound to the receptor. To remove magnesium from the pore of the channel, it requires a sufficient depolarization that will kick it out. Indeed, given that magnesium is a positively charged ion, it is attracted to the negative membrane potential of the neuron, and that is why it blocks the pore, but as the membrane potential gets depolarized, let's say from AMPA activity, the membrane potential becomes progressively more positive and now repels the magnesium out of the NMDA receptor. When the magnesium is removed, the ions can flow and the NMDA receptor produces an excitatory current. Because the NMDA receptor requires the binding of neurotransmitters, which come from the presynaptic side, and also a depolarization to kick out magnesium that comes from the postsynaptic side, the NMDA receptor is often referred to as a coincidence detector. In this case, the coincidence comes from the dual activity in the pre- and postsynaptic sides. One question to ask ourselves now is what exactly is the purpose behind the dual gating of the NMDA receptor? One good insight to this question is to remember that the receptor conducts calcium. As we've discussed in our conversation about G-protein coupled receptors, calcium can be used in the body as a second messenger to activate kinases and so on. For example, in the GQ pathway, calcium can bind to calmodulin and activate calcium calmodulin dependent kinase. The kinases will then go on and interact with downstream substrates that might lead to the formation of new proteins. Hence, the entry of calcium can have very important long lasting effects on the neuron beyond simply depolarizing it. As a quick foreshadowing note, NMDA receptors are very important in mechanisms that underlie synaptic plasticity due to their high calcium permeability, but we will come back to that aspect in due time when we discuss plasticity. Now, this removal of magnesium essentially constitutes a form of voltage dependence for the NMDA receptor, which is perfectly illustrated in its IV curve. As you can see, at negative membrane potentials when the magnesium blocks the receptor, there is no current because ions cannot flow. But when the membrane potential reaches a certain point, the current from the NMDA receptor becomes inward, which shows that the magnesium has left. As you go more and more positive, the IV curve of the NMDA receptor morphs with the IV curve of the non-NMDA receptors because obviously there is no more magnesium to block the channel. Beyond the different IV curves, NMDA receptors and the other glutamate receptors also differ on the time course of their current. To see this relationship, let's consider a plot of currents as a function of time. To obtain the results from all these receptors, we will perform a voltage clamp experiment on a terminal that contains these receptors. As a brief refresher of the voltage clamp technique, remember that the purpose of this method is to maintain the membrane potential of the neuron at a fixed voltage and measure what current it takes to maintain it at that voltage. Hence, the current you will see in the graph corresponds to the compensatory current.
The voltage clamp is explained in another video on the channel, so make sure to watch it if the method is still unclear. Now, one caveat with these receptors is that how can we tell what current goes through the NMDA receptor if the AMPA receptor or Canate receptor opens as well? One tool that we can use to isolate the current is by using some pharmacological blockers that prevent synaptic activity in the channel we do not want to measure. The pharmacological blockers in question are the antagonist I've pointed out. Hence, by considering a postsynaptic terminal with NMDA and AMPA receptors only, let's start by administering AP5 to the cell. As AP5 blocks the NMDA receptors, the voltage clamp results for the AMPA receptors are the following. To see how they compare to the NMDA receptors, we can perform the voltage clamp, but we now use CNQX to block AMPA receptors. The results for the NMDA receptors are the following. As you can see, when NMDA receptors open, the current rises and decays with a much slower time course than the AMPA receptors, which rise and decay very rapidly. When it comes to kinate receptors, they generate a current that rises quickly, but decays more slowly than AMPA receptors. You can imagine that to isolate their current, it requires a similar experimental setup as what I explained for the NMDA and AMPA currents. Alright, now that we understand the basics of glutamate synthesis, reuptake, and its receptors, I want to drive home a final concept that is very important in neurons of the central nervous system. As you can imagine, it is very important that the reuptake process of glutamate functions properly and efficiently to remove any extra glutamate that might be diffusing in a cleft. Indeed, if that glutamate is not removed properly, the glutamate might keep binding to the receptors and this will cause them to get constantly active. This overstimulation by glutamate is often referred to as glutamate excitotoxicity, and excitotoxicity can often lead to seizures or other abnormal firing patterns. Also, excitotoxicity can pose a particular problem with NMDA receptors because they are highly permeable to calcium. Thus, if the internal calcium concentration rises too much because the NMDA receptors are overactivated, it can lead to cell death because high calcium concentration activate proteins that end up killing the cell. Now, to finish our discussion on glutamate and its receptors, I want to briefly touch on the metabotropic receptors of glutamate. I will be a bit brief with these receptors because I have covered a lot of information on their mechanism of action already in our more general discussion on GPCRs. Nonetheless, I want to still give a few details about these receptors so we have a good and intuitive idea of what they do. First thing, Metabotropic glutamate receptors can be generally divided into three large groups that contain up to eight different forms of the receptor. These groups separate the mGluR based on the similarity of their amino acid composition, the G protein they activate, and what ligands they can bind. What I'll focus on here is the typical G protein they activate and where are they usually located. Note that what I'll say is not to be taken as an absolute because there are obviously exceptions to all these criteria but they will be good enough for us to get an idea. Alright, so when it comes to group 1, they generally activate the GQG protein, which, as you might remember, activates phospholipase C. This activation leads to the hydrolysis of PIP2 into the formation of two second messengers, IP3 and DAG, which subsequently activate different kinases. If you want more information on this pathway, I've thoroughly covered in the GPCR section. The receptors within group 1 are usually located postsynaptically and their activation usually mediates cell depolarization and increase in neuronal excitability. Additionally, in comparison to ionotropic receptors which are usually located in direct opposition of the glutamatergic presynaptic terminal, postsynaptic metabotropic glutamate receptors are usually located on the periphery. In comparison to group 1 mGluRs, Group 2 and group 3 mGluRs are usually coupled to the GIG protein, which is responsible for inhibiting adenyl cyclase and the subsequent production of CAMP. As a consequence of this, phosphorylation in the cell is reduced. Group 2 and 3 receptors are also associated with direct regulation of ion channels by the liberation of the beta and gamma subunits. Receptors in group 2 and 3 are often localized presynaptically and generally mediate inhibition of transmitter release. As I said, there are a lot of other mechanisms and pathways that these receptors mediate, but this should suffice for our purposes. Alright, with glutamate now covered, we can move on to the next neurotransmitter, 
If you recall from the start of this section, one huge difference between neurons in the central nervous system and neurons at the neuromuscular junction is the fact that neurons in the central nervous system can have an excitatory or inhibitory output on the postsynaptic cell. Accordingly, given that we've established that glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter, we need to now consider what is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. The main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system is gamma-aminobutyric acid, or simply GABA. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.